Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. I am Fahima Mohammed, your host and relationship coach. I want to welcome all of you from all of us here on British Muslim TV, whether you're watching live on Sky Channel 752 or streaming on Facebook or Twitter. We want to thank you for always supporting us and tuning in. And of course, we welcome you to join in the conversation as well, where you can discuss any of your sort of, you know, whatever you're going through, or if you have any questions or comments or queries, you can definitely relay them to myself or my guests tonight. And the way you can do that is calling in directly into the studio on 01924-231-083. Please make sure you ask the bill payers permission as standard network rates do apply. However, you can also contact me and send in a written free WhatsApp message, which I can read out on the show. And that number is 07585835150. We do hope to hear some of your voices tonight. I know it's quite daunting to actually address some of the topics that we raise, but it's there definitely for reasons so that we can give some tips, insights, and inshallah, some practical ways of moving forward through any of your challenges, adversities, because relationships is so huge. And we bring on different guests in order for us to sort of address majority of what most of us are going Going through. And tonight is no different as we're going to be discussing co parenting with a narcissist. And I think it's really interesting, might be triggered at times, but uh, inshallah, we're going to get through this by hopefully giving you some more insights. And with me tonight, please help me welcome Farooq Ismail. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sister Fahima. How are you? I am very well. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time. Now, this is a very important topic. And I'm really glad that we're addressing this because we don't really talk about this. You know, we talk about divorce, but not into sort of detail and in depth when it comes to co-parenting. So Absolutely. before we go into that, um, tell me a little bit about yourself and why does this topic interest you as well? Well, basically, March the 16th, 2022, my relationship ended for various reasons. And as my relationship ended, I was under this delusion that once my relationship ends, I will have my own time with my children uninterrupted. And that was a delusion. I quickly found out basically that I have, I quickly found overnight lost complete contact with my children and realized that was not the case. And I was delusional in believing that. Hence then months of not seeing my children, all the pain and trauma of that has led me to start Scholified Dads and look into this further and ultimately try and bring more exposure to this whole thing. And then also, I asked myself questions as to how I got here. And in order to address those questions, I had to look all the way back and look at the relationship I had with my children prior to my relationship ending. So hence, um, you know, I have come into this space. Wow. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's not easy to even speak about these things generally um, amongst your peers, let alone to come on a space and a platform like this. So firstly, I want to thank you and I want to appreciate that and acknowledge that it is something that is, it's, um, you know, it can be quite triggering, not just for yourself, but people that are watching. And it's really important that we do raise these issues, especially with people that have some sort of experience about this, because again, that's how we raise awareness as well as create sort of like some sort of assistance and the fact that Absolutely. you've not just taken it amongst um you know your own private situation but to bring it out into sort of like a public awareness and a platform that you have yourself which is um something that we really do need and i will be asking about your details towards the end of the show so please do stay tuned because hopefully if you are interested further and you want to get hold of farouk we're going to definitely get those details as well towards the end now, when it comes to this, I know I hear a lot of women saying, well, we got to hear both sides. And who is the real narcissist here? And, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot. OK, so we're going to be fair. But yeah. I do believe personally, I have a lot of women that do come on the show and speak even about things like this. But we don't have enough Muslim men and their voices. So that's why I am really proud and happy to have you tonight to speak. 
Now, what is it that um, makes it so difficult for men to even address this whole issue or even recognize it? Because like you said, you were so surprised and you had this illusion about, you know, how things are going to end. Even when you're going through a divorce, you don't know what you're going to get yourself into. So what is that surprise that people need to be aware of so that they can take some steps or even think twice? I think firstly, uh, fathers ultimately, husbands and fathers need to realize that the law and the system that we have in place, unfortunately, is geared up against fathers. That's not me being biased. That is what it is. And let me put it, let me give you a statistic at the moment. Currently in the UK, 90% of the resident parent are mothers. Fathers, 90% of fathers are non-resident parents. That's not an accident. That is an accepted position of society right now that the father is due to lose contact. And even amongst the Muslim community in England, I think we all have an understanding that the child will go with the mother and it's an accepted position. But once you enter the system and you realize the delusion that there are laws in place to protect the children, to ensure both parents have contact, you have this delusion and until you enter the family court system, you realize there is no such thing. It is absolute, when well, they call it the family court madness, it is absolute madness. The system in itself, I have to say, is completely flawed and there are mechanisms in place to ensure hurdles and barriers are placed between you and your children. Let me give you an example. I haven't seen, for example, my children since March the 16th, 2022. No phone call, no visits, no video calls, no nothing overnight complete contact gone with my three children. Now, I could drive one mile up the road now, I could be outside where they are, but I can't see them, I haven't seen them. How is that even possible in any society that a parent, a child cannot see one of his parents so easily, it is done so easily, and there's a whole system that is built up around, let's say, uh, false allegations of domestic abuse. Once allegations of domestic abuse are placed, the whole system, the whole family court machine gears up behind the, um, the supposed perpetrator. And all contact is lost. And you're not just lost contact with you. There are no services for men once those allegations are laid. So you could potentially be homeless, jobless, literally left on the streets. You will get no help from any government mechanism or, or any part of society. And unfortunately, in the community, what happens is when someone is labeled, when a man is labeled with allegations, it is very easy, it's very believable. Unfortunately, look, when a sister is making allegations and she's crying and she looks like a victim and then you see a typical Muslim brother, it is very hard to believe that he's not the perpetrator. So unfortunately, society turn against you, your own community turn against you, the police, the government, the family court machine is aligned against you and you are fighting an uphill battle all the way through whilst you are still uh, mourning the loss of your children on a daily basis. And I mean, once you so... come here, you fully understand the devastation of it. That's that's what I mean. Your eyes fully open to the reality of the devastation. Yeah, no, I completely hear you. And I do empathize and I do feel the compassion. Um, I do deal with a lot of cases like that myself. And I see it from both sides, to be fair. Um, but what about those cases that are real? I mean, I know with the statistics that you've mentioned, how much percentage of that statistics that can can you even say that is real allegations and not real allegations? Because, you know, we have to be careful here because unfortunately we do get a lot of sisters complaining at the fact that when there are these false allegations, it's still a minority compared to the ones that are actually true. No, and listen, I totally sympathize with sisters that are going through this, and I, I disqualified that we support sisters that are, are, are on the receiving end of this, mm -hmm. and sisters that are legitimately being uh, exposed to domestic abuse of any sort, and we support them. But the thing is, it's the, uh, how can I put it? The abuse element should not be gendered. The point is, abuse is abuse, regardless of the gender committing it, and the, regardless of the regardless of the perpetrator or the victim. Abuse is abuse and should be called out. As soon as we go into, but there are real female victims, real male victims. The point is, you're not highlighting the issue. The issue is abuse. Now, if we go into, say, coercive control, for example, so domestic abuse or physical abuse. You can have evidence to see that if someone's been physically abused, there should be a threshold or a barrier of evidence. In the family court, unfortunately, it is done on a balance of probability. There's no evidence required. 
And with the coercive control laws in place, now coercive control could mean anything. Now, Fahima, you're a relationship coach, right? Yeah. It is healthy for any couple to argue. For if a married couple says they've never had an argument, they're not a married couple. It is healthy to argue. It happens. Everyone argues. Every married couple. Now, if every argument is brought into the family court, for example, and where in any argument where the say the husband disagreed with the wife, that is labelled as coercive control ultimately if uh, say a wife disagrees with the husband that's not labeled as coercive control it is the other way around yeah. so a lot of men are dealing with the point is the position that they start with is very you you're you're fighting an uphill battle almost straight away so Absolutely. coercive control you that, you that disagree could be with the color of the paint or something that's coercive. you you are then labeled an abuser based on coercive control and i also i'll go as far as saying i think more men especially in the South Asian community, are coercively controlled in relationships. I genuinely believe that regardless of the statistics that are put out there, because 50% of those men don't even know it. That's the point. Yeah. I was going to ask you that, actually, um, with regards to the Muslim community, because, again, we don't recognize this very well. And I don't even think there's many statistics out there in the Muslim community to be fair, to even say it and call it for what it is. But obviously you dealing with these situations and you now, you know, again, you, in a way, you have these kind of statistics because you've got a lot of people coming to you. What are the main problems that men are facing? What about the fact that if a man has money, doesn't that actually help in the courts? Money, look, money can help in two ways. There's two ways looking at the family court, right? So once you enter the family court system, there's the emotional element. So depending on which, uh, if whether the husband or the wife, whoever called the relationship off, the other partner's going through the heartbreak. So dealing with the emotional uh, trauma of the relationship ending. Then there's the emotional trauma of who's got the kids, who took control and took charge and took control of the children and the situation. Then there's the financial element of uh, a settlement on your sort of estate and your assets. And potentially one... Uh, one part, uh, the father nine out of ten times is going to end up at the home, out of the children's life, life's work in tatters, and walk away with nothing. That is the absolute reality. So the position is so skewed the other way. A father doesn't have much chance of recovering from this. And the problem is this: if, say, the false allegations are laid, uh, one party is incentivized to lay these false allegations because there's other people on the back of it making money. Listen, Farouk, so, we're going to go into this a lot more in detail because you're giving us so much information, but we are coming up to our first break. It's gone by so quickly, and I don't want you to mention anything so important where I'm going to have to cut you off there, but we will be joining Farouk back in a few moments. Please do stay with us. It's a very important topic tonight, and I hope to see you in a few moments. Please don't go away, and we will see you shortly. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We're having a very, very deep conversation with Farouk tonight. And um, if you are triggered by this, please do take care. And if you need to contact us, you can do on britishmuslim.tv forward slash support. This is a very touching subject when it comes to children and co-parenting. And as we know, a lot of divorce doesn't really, or no divorce ends up where, you know, it's going to be amicable. Most of the time there is one party that is going to be quite disheartened. They don't want that. And that's understandable. But when they're using children as a weapon to a certain extent or making false allegations, we have discovered that generally a lot of the times that the men get the raw end of the deal if they are falsely accused and they're not given the space to actually prove themselves just on an assumption. And when that assumption is made, it's actually so detrimental to their future. And also the fact that the system that we have, especially in the UK, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be a lot more uh, fair as it says or claims as per our guest's experience, as well as who the, he deals with in this kind of like area. Now, when you do have men, especially coming from our community, complaining about this, what is the common factor that you see? And how can we break down those kind of like barriers, whether it's relationships from the beginning, putting things in place when you are in a relationship, and also when you end, um, how can you sort of secure yourself? Or is there such a thing? 
Right, there's four ways of looking at this. There's firstly, there's those youngsters who are entering, let's say those youngsters who are looking to get married this year, next year, the year after. So there's certain things that they need to be aware of and understand and certain red flags that they need to look out for. So we need to create a, a little study around that for them to follow. Then there's those in relationships currently who are being coercively controlled and managed and they are prisoners in those relationships and they are scared because they're going to potentially lose contact with their children. They are being controlled and managed through the children and that threat of losing contact. So they're stuck in those relationships ultimately and they have to hold a party line. And there's those who have ended the relationships or their partners ended the relationships. They have found themselves estranged from their children there's a certain angle that we need to, ha to tackle those fathers. And there's those who have lost contact for many years with their children. It's just to keep them going, keep, give them hope and basically, you know, help them to move on with their life, basically. So there's many angles we can tackle this. Now, for the youngsters that are going into relationships, the key thing with all the common factor for all four groups is the fact that they need to understand the law and the society we live in. Because the common theme with all fathers that I speak to is relationship ended. They still had this delusion that they will have contact with their children. We live in a first world country. England conquered one quarter of the world or whatever it was. So they presume we have law and processes and procedures in place to protect all parties. That's what we assume when we think of England, courts, family courts. Now, this is the main exposure that I think needs creating for everyone. Firstly, all, everyone needs to understand in, in the family law, basically, a father has no rights. Father's rights have been abolished. A child has a right to spend time with both parents, but a father has no automatic rights in the law. Now, like I said, when I entered the system, I had this delusion. The question I ask is, why did I have this delusion? Along with all the fathers I speak to, they have this delusion that, they're going to get some time with their children because of the laws and processes we have in place. Because it is a well-kept secret, it is hiding, the family court system, the family court machine is hiding in plain sight. Now, once you enter the system, you're not allowed to talk about it, you're not allowed to tell, it, tell anyone, you're not allowed to talk about the case. That helps keep it sort of secret. And within this secrecy, people need to understand one gender is incentivized. They are, they are financially incentivized and they are embroiled into this. Because on the back of this, on the back of the family breakdown, back of the relationship breakdown, there are people that are making a lot of money. So for example, one child access hit case, one child access full case, three to four hearings could potentially cost up to 30,000 pounds. Now if one party is getting that on legal aid, there are solicitors and barristers making almost £30,000 on the back of that. But to secure that legal aid, it has to be a case involving domestic abuse. So now it is in the sort of solicitor's interest to push that narrative because they, will be, they are financially incentivized. And unfortunately, in most cases, mothers are taken advantage of. This is what I will say. Relationship breaks down. People are emotional. People are upset. People want to get back at the other party. So these solicitors and organizations take advantage of these sisters, unfortunately, and they incentivize them into making these allegations. Once these allegations are placed, legal aid is secured, this is then dragged on at the cost of the children. During this process, these children are denied contact with the non-resident parent because this is incentivized and people are making money on the back of it. And unfortunately, I think these sisters are being taken advantage of when they are emotional and vulnerable. That's what I want to get. That's the exposure that we need to create. So for all parties involved, we need to understand that there are no laws in place to protect fathers, unfortunately. And, the, and as much as we, you know, this is a great country, there are many things, good things. The family court system is flawed in many ways. That is what needs to get out there and all parties need to understand. 
Now, there I are hear many you. ways that people... Before you carry Sorry. on, Baruch, I hear you very clearly. I just want to say, from my understanding, um, working as, alongside solicitors and barristers as well, I mean, there is this um, overall narrative that they are there not even for the parents, but they're there for the children. But hearing you, it's, it's more sort of geared up as to they can use a stronger case if there are certain allegations put in place. But do you think yes. it is the law then, or do you think it's the people that is manipulating the law? Because, you know, the law yes. is set up okay. for children, so we have to be very careful how we use this. And again, solicitors are, you know, obviously, yes, there is a money-making um, sort of way of, you know, looking at this, and it could be also a personal issue where a lot of people are looking at it from that point of view. But again, I'm dealing with a current case right now, and... It's the wife that's being denied access and she's the one that's not, you know, so there's plenty of cases like that too, which do exist. So I'm just trying yes. to really understand the crux of it. Is it money that really drives it? Is it the parent that has the stronger voice or is it the solicitor or the law? So we need to obviously, you know, break that down as well in order to understand which direction, you know, we have to be geared up in as well. Okay, let's, let's tackle this from a few different angles. I've asked this question myself. The family court, is it there for mother, father, or neither, because it's meant to be there for the children? If Once you enter the system, the amount of hurdles and barriers that are placed um, to, in front of one parent, so let's call it the non-resident parent. Let's not put mother or father. The non-resident parent has so many hurdles and barriers placed on them and every hurdle and barrier costs thousands. And even just to get one phone call with your child, it is so difficult. Like I said, lost contact overnight. The family court is not there for the children. And I'll, I'll take it back to the UN Convention and the Istanbul Convention for Women and Girls. Now, the Istanbul Convention for Women and Girls is written into uh, many, many countries, many organizations, I believe, including the family court system. Now, the family court system will treat, unfortunately, mother as the victim regardless. Mother is treated and seen as a victim, and these are many, many cases of what we have seen. I know of a one case where a blind man, a man going blind, he had 30% eyesight left in one eye, wasn't allowed to have an up-to-date photo of his daughters that he hadn't seen for almost four or five years, because judge said, let me ask mum. Mum said, no, so you can't have a photo. Now, there is no risk of a blind, you know, a man going blind. Having a photo of his children is no risk to the mother whatsoever, but it's the, the balance of power. And let's take this idea that um, they are there to protect victims, they're there for the children. Now, the solicitors and barristers that represent, say, the victims that claim legal aid, they also represent the other party. They make money from both sides. And when you look at the family court system, the way things are dragged on, a fact find hearing could go on for three or four days. We're talking random allegations with no evidence. You can disprove all of these allegations and you still get found, the, the non-resident parent can still get found guilty based on a balance of probability. This fact find will cost normally the non-resident parent near enough 10,000 pounds to be told he's guilty and to go on a perpetrator's course, which will cost 2,000 pounds. I am talking about normal far, normal people that are not capable of these things. And some of the allegations are so wild and ludicrous. Look, those who have not entered it, it can still appear to be law and order. When you enter it, understand what I'm saying. There, There is no, it is complete madness. The family court is completely not broken. It is complete madness and it's complete lunacy. I do not believe anyone there is for the children. The judge is on £2,000 a day. The legal aid lawyers are on 25 to 30,000 pounds. The the person representing the, the solicitor barristers representing the non-resident parent, they're on 25, 30,000 pounds on a full sort of hearing and a full uh, C100 application. And the, the amount of money we are talking about, like I said, into the thousands. Now you can get a, you can self-represent in the family court or you can get a McKenzie friend for a fraction of the cost. Let me give you an example of the sort of money we're talking. To file a C100 application, a C100 application is an application for child access. You give this information to the solicitor that he fills out. You have all the information that you give him. In London, they charge 1,000 to 1,500 pounds to fill this form out that you give them all the information for. Technically, you could download this form and fill it out yourself for free. 
how can you justify a cost of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds to fill out one form because you are solicit about it? It's because they play on fear. When, when the non-resident parent goes into the solicitor's office, you are emotionally, you're an emotional roller coaster. You haven't seen your children. You don't know when you're going to see your children. What solicitors do is they feed into that fear with a little bit of hope where you think you're going to see your children at the end of this. So they, pre they play on your primal feelings of wanting to be with your child. Now, if you have to pay five, 10,000 pounds, you'll think to yourself, it's only five grand. It's only 10, it's only 10,000 pounds. I will see my child at the end of it. They know full well that or what chances you have and you don't, but they still string you along. So when you see this, now I know many fathers who have paid 10, 15, 20, 30,000 pounds. There's one case even up to upwards of 50,000 pounds. They still have no contact with their children. The solicitor knew he had well, the sort of allegations again, he was facing. Thank you so much for giving us all those statistics and a lot of the case studies, which again, we're going to pick up again when we come back from the break. These are really alarming stories and we are definitely going to question that and we're going to also dive into much more around this topic. Please don't go away. We will see you in a few moments. Very, very important. Inshallah, we we'll hope to see you tuning in once we come back. Take care. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. I just want to re remind the guests that we're having a very interesting conversation, which you can participate if you have any questions and queries. But honestly, I don't even want to speak because I'm just blown away by the information, the insights that Farouk is sharing with us today. Of course, it is his opinion. And of course, it's around, you know, the case studies that he sees. And I am obviously trying to understand a lot more deeper. And it is quite alarming to hear the statistics, the case studies, a lot of the scenarios that is happening. And I'm so, so glad that we do have you on tonight. So I just want to thank you again, because it's really, really, you know, important that we have voices like you. And I'm so glad that we've given you the space to talk. Um, when it comes to this, I know you've raised a lot of the issues and the problems. Now, let's go because, you know, I mean, I'm sure I can do a series with you with this kind of information, but I want to break it down. Um, what do you think will be the solution for something like this? Would it be knowing the law better, making sure that you go to mediation first and actually have more of an amicable sort of solution if it's possible? You know, having a good exit in your divorce, even though there's no guarantee, but just so that people are aware that there is such a high chance. And I do know personally of so many cases that people are in really miserable, unfulfilled marriages because they are exactly afraid of exactly what you're talking about right now. So uh -huh. what would be your personal solutions um, for people who okay, are uh, regardless in that sort of situation, you know, to either prepare for it or in that situation, knowing that if they're going to exit, is there a way okay. or a solution? It, it depends. Okay, look, we got to tackle it in two ways. So if you're in a relationship that is a, a rocky place, it's on rocky waters, what tends to happen in most cases now and all the case studies that I've seen, the pattern is the same. And it's not me being, but this is the, the numbers and these are the facts. The women tend to act first. They have this innate sixth sense that I now need to act and they seem to have all the legalities in place. And what I've learned is in the family court system, the only way you can be successful is the one who acts first gets ahead. Then the other person <laughs> is playing catch up. Currently, unfortunately, 90% of fathers are playing catch up. They don't know what's happened. They don't know how they got there. Now, if you're in the relationship, and it is headed that way. The only other way to avoid this is if there are sensible people on both sides, if you can sit down and do it over a table. So if you have, and this is a big if, if you have sensible people around you, get them together and arrange the breakup properly over a table, put in the children first, because this generational trauma will continue on in the children if we don't do it like this. We need to come up with a better model. 
But the reality is this now, after many, obviously, podcasts and interviews and discussing this, as long as one party is fully incentivized, there are financial incentives to deny contact. Mm. Let me give you a quick example about CMS. And this is where the problem is uh, as far as the country we live in and the system that's in place. As long as whatever the law is and the system that's in place, people, the societal behavior will conform to the law in place. So if one side is rewarded, unfortunately, they will go towards the hun. And and that is where the problem is. So this is where we've got to look at ourselves as Muslims and decide, are we going to partake in this? Because when it comes to the family court, unfortunately, everyone is a controversial statement. Everyone becomes an atheist. When you enter the family court, everyone becomes atheist. No one cares about right, wrong, halal, haram. Sunnah, children, people have sold their iman, they've sold their religion along with their children. So if there's murky waters ahead, my only advice is to father, uh, well, to all parents, mainly I have to say to fathers, because fathers are a bit clueless about this, is understand mm-hmm. you, whilst you are with the children in the family home, you have rights. The moment that breakup happens and the family court machine is is got involved. The family court machine is involved. Then ultimately, you are on a losing. You're on the losing side. So whilst you're with the children, you may have some rights. As soon as you break away from that, or you are forced out of there via the police or the family court, you're already in trouble. So if you're going through it now, you are on rocky stages. Connect with some Mackenzie friends and fathers groups. Learn the ins and outs of what rights you have and what rights you do not have. Understand what leverage you have, what leverage you do not have. Because ultimately what's happened is once the breakup happens, the one that has the children has all the leverage. Mm -hmm. So if it was a bad breakup anyway, you're on rocky, you're in a rocky place anyway, you're you're hating on each other, then one party is fully incentivized and weaponized. And that's how it seems to be playing out currently. So I would say if we can get sensible people from both sides to sit down, do it over a table, breakups are going to happen. The days of where you got married and lived together, that was you done for the next 50 years, I think personally are over. Yes. And the other problem with the community, Sister Fahima, all these sensible elders are no longer around. And what I've noticed in the community as well, where where there was this stigma around divorce and women, that stigma, I don't think is that it's as bad anymore. No, no. Sisters aren't that concerned about wearing that label. And unfortunately, with the South Asian community, that you know, it is very toxic in many ways, unfortunately. We have sisters who have brothers and fathers and mothers who are encouraging this behavior and getting behind this behavior. Yeah. I and totally hear you there. I totally hear you there. And you mentioned something very important, actually. We don't have the elders. And I would go even further to say we do not have the actual scholars and imams and communities that are head, that are actually They're somewhere silent. that people can turn. Because that's what yes. we need in order for us to not even go. Because as much as we have the legal system, and as you say, it may not play par with what we are even in line with in values, and we lose all of those kind of beliefs and values. And As much as it's set up to what it is, you can be deterred in one way just to gain and just to win, losing, you know, the sort of belief system. So if we had our mosques more where they can have this kind of mediation, where they will look up to an elder, where they'll have a role model, where they'll have someone who's not just sitting there on a Friday giving the khutbah, but actually being practical about their community that they serve and actually serve in these kind of places alongside counsellors and psychotherapists and mediators and things like that. That's what we need and that's what's missing. Because on the other hand, there, there has been a system in the past or even whether it's from you know sort of the traditional background countries in the southeast asian or arab countries where you know women were taken advantage of as well on the extreme side and they come here and then it's gone to the other extreme so we want to be balanced and real because islam does not you know promote either regardless right so i recognize that I completely recognize that and I hear you. And yes, divorces are not in the happy place. And obviously one is going to be, you know, completely not, you know, uh, completely against it, not wanting it, wanting to get the best to show that, you know, I've won, even though I didn't get this relationship. And I always coach in that way to say, you know, we do need to think firstly in a spiritual way. Our mind needs to be spiritual first. 
And then we need to take steps. And what's really important is the actual children. Because I know I've coached and women don't like me as well, because I will call them out on these certain things when they, you know, sort of like, you know, call that label and that card of victim and abuse in, thrown around. But when we say co-parenting with a narcissist, how would you define a narcissist? And how would some par parent even be seen in that way? Because again, you know, that label is, uh, is it sort of, you know, some sort of like diagnosis or is it narcissistic behavior? There's different ways of even describing that. Oh, yes. And uh, look, there's many ways to tackle this. First, I want to touch on your first point. Like you said, from our community leaders, I've sat down with an imam recently, did a podcast and we drilled down into some of this. And I agree with you 100%. We have absolute silence from the community leaders. Either they're not qualified to talk about it. Either this is a touchy subject. And the imam that I spoke to is on my channel. He categorically called out the Sharia councils and all the imams and other places saying they're not talking about it because it doesn't, unfortunately, some of them, it doesn't serve their interest. Mm -hmm. Some of these Sharia council, unfortunately, from the horror stories I've heard, there is big business also in dishing out kulas. There's, there's big money yeah. involved, unfortunately where there is money involved, and unfortunately, Sharia accounts, they're not regulated. I could mm. potentially get together with an imam or, or alim or someone tomorrow, and as he said to me, we could open one tomorrow. It is unregulated, and there is money behind this, unfortunately, because women are initiating divorce. Hence, because there's a demand, it's supply and demand. Women are initiating the, the, uh, the divorce, unfortunately, cross community cultures. That has now cropped up this issue with the Sharia councils where with the supply and demand, unfortunately, and money's involved. So more alims, more community leaders need to come out and talk about this because I believe this is, in 10 years, we will see the full effects of this Yes. because the ummah ultimately is being destroyed. And I want to cred give credit to you and the other sisters who are talking about this openly and challenging this. We need more sisters to come out and deal with this. Yes. I do not think the fathers alone, the men alone, standing together is going to bring change. We need the sisters to stand together mm -hmm. And I say to all sisters out there, you are mothers, you are aunties, you have sons, you have nephews, you have younger brothers, younger cousins, whatnot. Tomorrow, these men will face the same system. You do not want your nephew, your son, or your cousin to face the same system we have in place now. Because amongst other communities, up to 10 men a day are choosing to end it because of the pressure of the family court machine. It is very difficult. People do not realize how difficult it is. And God forbid it is your son, your nephew, or a, a man from your family that ends up, you know, you end up attending their janazah because uh, of this situation. Yeah. So do you what was your second question? Courts, you do you think, though, Farouk, that um, obviously, you know, you personally have lost hope in the sort of like, you know, European or whether it's, you know, the UN or the UK court system, especially family courts, is there a, a place that people can sort of like, um, you know, go against that or challenge the narrative right now and the laws? And is that even being in place? Because what you're saying, mm -hmm. if it's at that scale, then I'm sure that's not just you. I'm sure there's plenty of other groups, even outside the Muslim community, because it's not about communities. It's about families. It's about the unit. It's about parents. It's about fathers. Is there something that is wider that's actually going to be? Yes, out there? yes. See, see this issue, Fahima, currently now, yeah, so we're talking America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, England, any first world country, Western country, there is a major sort of epidemic around divorce, separation, lost contact, fatherless homes, there is an epidemic. Now, other communities have been decimated. The Muslim community in England has been insulated up until the last 10 years, I will say. And up until the last five years, it's fully taken off and is now spiking at a rapid rate compared to previous years. So we're now just finding out about the laws in place. Now, because the family court system, as I said, it all ties in. It is a secret court. It's been kept secret for 40 years. Now, there is, an, if we go back to the UN convention, the Istanbul Convention for Women, and there is no convention for men and boys globally. The rate of men taking their lives globally is almost four times more than women. Is there a reason for that? Is that an accident? And like I said, 10 men a day in England post-separation, yeah, it is linked. So as far as the convention is concerned, I think until the full exposure comes out, and I think it's now down to the Muslim community, other community communities have been decimated and nothing's happened the last 30 years. 
The father's movement is fractured. The father's movement, for some reason, can't pull together. There are hundreds of thousands of fathers, but you try and get 100 fathers together to stand up against this. You try and get 10,000 fathers to sign a petition. It why is, is that? For some reason, it's difficult. I don't know why, and that's what I'm trying to expose and address. For some reason, the fathers move, all the fathers' movements need to pull together up and down the country. Because there are hundreds of thousands of fathers, I believe, that have no contact with their children. So why is it that we cannot get together? And I believe at least once the expo for example, the reason I'm doing this and I've started disqualified dads is to create the ground level exposure for the layman, for the average guy who can understand average street language, average workman language, to know what the system is about. Once there is sufficient exposure, I think, and once it is household knowledge, then we can bring change, ultimately. We'll bring change once exposure. So right now, for me, I think exposure is key. Once yes. there's enough exposure, the movement grows, and then we can get people behind it. But as a community, I think it is now down to the Muslim. We have to look. We were insulated up until now. It has now fully penetrated our community. This ideology has penetrated our community and is growing at a rapid rate. Absolutely, now, we, Baruch, know we are coming on to our final break. And again, you have given us so much food for thought. I am so grateful again to have you on the show. But do not go away. So we do have our final segment coming up soon. And again, we're going to be questioning him on so much more details. You definitely have to stay for the last part as I will be back in a few moments with Baruch. Please join us then. Salam. Salam alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We are on the final part of the episode and I'm actually quite sad to say that because I've been really interested to um, learn so much statistics, stories and scenarios around this topic. And if you've just joined in and tuned in, please do rewind. You will find this extremely useful and valuable and it's for all families. Our Muslim community, unfortunately, has a very high rate of divorce and breakdown in family units and when we're breaking down our family homes we are you know initially and essentially breaking down you know such a huge community uh sort of like environment and our future generations because when the family unit at home is broken then that's when we have less and less strength as an ummah so that's why it's so important that we take heed as to what we're doing. And even our immediate decisions are going to be such an impact for so many generations to come. So don't just, you know, go with your initial emotion as heartbreaking, as painful as it is. We do need to consider more around this. Now, Farouk, I just want to again thank you for being with us tonight. I don't want to leave it till the end of the show because I know your work is so important. And again, I love the fact that you are raising this awareness and you're bringing it to the forefront and you're speaking even on your own sort of platform and, you know, addressing it from different perspectives. If people want to reach out to you, whether it's to have a conversation, whether it's for assistance, how do they reach you? They can um, email me at disqualified.dads at gmail.com. Um, I am on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. They can message me on Instagram or TikTok, or they can email me, and then I can get in touch with them, and we can take the conversation from there. How do you find the success rate once you're sort of in this, or is there such a thing, or do you just support people to kind of cope and manage, and what are those coping mechanisms once you're in this unfortunate circumstance? I think once you initially... so. There's two ways to look at this. So there's the relationship coming to an end. A lot of fathers I speak to, unfortunately, their wives chose to end the relationship. Now, to, we can all deal with an ending of a relationship or a heartbreak. That is manageable. But unfortunately, the rest of the baggage that comes with it, the loss of contact with the kids, potentially the homeless from the home you've lived in for 10, 15, 20 years, and depending on how old you are, so, for example, if someone's in their 20s and relationships come to an end, it's easier to bounce back. It, they may need less help. They'll, they'll have a couple of bad years, but they may get over it not without too much difficulty. When you're in your 30s, it brings a different challenge. Now, those in their 40s and 50s, when, when a relationship breaks down after 15, 20 years, You've got teenage, you know, teenage children who don't want no contact with you, and you end up homeless. It is very hard to, you know, 
know that you're going to build back up, buy a house again and be independent again and find happiness again, very difficult. So there's multiple challenges. Now, if you initially end up in that breakup, you've lost contact with your children, you are homeless, those people are, I would say, they're on a roller coaster. You're on an emotional roller coaster. You need to belt up, brace up, and hold on for dear life. For the following six to eight months, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to be very, very difficult. And it is those six to eight months are crucial to knowing whether you will make it or not. Within those six to eight months, those people around that person need to give them hope. So what I do is I give these people hope. I let them, I, let, I get them through that day. So when someone calls me, if I'm chatting to that father, he's going for a moment. I get him through that next hour or the next day. That's it. I get him through that day. You're not going to get him through every day, but you need to get him through that moment at that time because that pain is so sharp and severe. It's there 24 seven, every second of every hour of every day, you're feeling that anxiety. If you can get, make it to the end of the day, Tomorrow we start again. If he can get through another day till he gets strong enough to manage on his own. And unfortunately, in the community, people turn up to you. When you're going through this and people come to you and say, forget your children, you're never going to see them again and stuff like that, it's not helpful. Yeah. You're not helping that guy. He's, he's holding on to hope that he's going to see his kids. So we have to get him through those six to eight months and make him believe in himself and try and put hope inside that person again. If they can make those six to eight months, they can potentially survive. Because that morning period of not seeing your children, it, like I said, it's years later, it still affects you, but you can survive. But when you're going through that daily bereavement every single day, it's the longer it goes on, you can manage it a bit better, but you're still going to feel the pain. But the, those initial early days are crucial to give them hope. So I give them hope. And with my work, my work seems to give them hope. And when they know I can connect with them, because the other thing is this, the fathers that are going through this, they need to connect with other fathers who have been through this. Yeah, they can I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you that because you can, you know, I know a lot of men are quite reluctant and resistant to even going and speaking to a professional and they don't like the counseling sort of process, for example, and speaking to another man and someone who's gone through it on a similar sort of like, you know, um, sort of way of uh, experience. Do you think that could be more useful and, and other fathers help other fathers is more useful? Or do you think they do need to take the extra steps to go seek professional help as well? What's your opinion on that? The thing is, I can say they should do that, but I've experienced that. And I know when you're in that stage, you don't care about anything. You've given up. So you've got to understand when you see these men sometimes on the street, you know, you see homeless people, you sometimes wonder how did these men get there? The mechanisms, of the mechanisms of the system we have in place has put them there and they have been left there effectively to die. That is the reality. I have slept and walked with these men on the streets. When you are there, the fact is, when you say to a guy like that, you should get counselling or something, he's not listening. He's, when you've given up inside, no one can help you. But the key is this. I say it to those fathers, those fathers who have children, you need to get up and continue for your children. Not for yourself, not for anyone else, because those children are innocent. And no matter what happened, no matter how you see yourself, no matter if you think you failed, you're a failure, you caused this, or this is your fault, those children still look up to you and love you. To them, you are still their dad, you are still their hero. Hold on to your children. Put your children at the forefront of your brain. So when you have these thoughts, when you're at rock bottom, when you cannot continue for those painful few hours of the day sometimes, think of your children. If you stay alive and you continue, you stay on your feet and you battle, there is a possibility you will see them again. You will make contact again and you will wonder, why did I think like that? Why was I thinking of ending it? Hence, hold on to your children. Hold on to the memories of your children and hold on to any hope. Those that are going for it, hold on to any hope that you can. And you have to believe we are Muslims. Hence, mm -hmm. believe in your faith, believe in Allah, put your faith in Allah, and know that he's got you. But hold on to something, especially your children and your faith, and get through those days. It will get easier. And once you get to a good place emotionally, then maybe you can fight to go see your children. You can take steps to now use the system to your advantage to try and get to see your children. There are tactics and 
plays that you can make to use the system. It's not. It's difficult. It's an uphill battle. If you give up, you will never know. So if you're going to go down, well, you know give what, it your Robert, best shot. You've given us so much tonight, and I really want to, you know, say I'm so so grateful for your time, your insights. It's been an absolute pleasure, and it's come so quickly to the end of the show, unfortunately. But I think you ended it beautifully by giving people hope and giving a few tips as well. So I just want to say thank you for your time tonight. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate no, it. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please do check out his page. If you know what you want or you're going through it yourself, I really do urge you to please take those steps because as Farouk mentioned, those initial stages are crucial for your well-being and your sort of like motivation to move on further. These are very serious issues that we are raising on the show and I do appreciate your support and you tuning in and your time, your comments and also all of your emails that I do receive, I do read and I do take notes of everything. Make sure that you do watch from the beginning and inshallah we will be back same time, same place with another topic and guest. I hope to see you then. I want to thank you so much, especially our special guest tonight, Farooq Ismail. Inshallah he continues with you.